2024 and where are we at on production schedule for the birds so they're on a 37 day production schedule they were hatched about march 10th 2024 so making them about 24 days old now so leaving them only about 13 days to go so say two weeks uh and they're just they're going to grow more and more rapidly from this point on to finish and this is sort of a little bit of a test for us because we usually raise them to 42 days and we're contemplating coming off of 2023 trying to aim for a 35 day production schedule so 37 is kind of short for us and so you know we're a little bit concerned are we going to get the size in the birds production wise that we want to that we are used to getting we hope so uh that actually is a little bit easier to do when weather conditions are more favorable but we've had mild weather uh you know we're in rural southeast ohio usa and it's april so when these birds started in march we had some cold nights had some cold temperatures and that's always a concern because some of their energy you know is diverted to all of their work toward thermoregulation keeping their bodies a comfortable temperature and we have supplemental heat lamps for that but it's still a strain on the birds if the ambient temperature gets way out of the range that they want to be in where they're living so uh, in this video today going to talk about a couple of things and actually just going to hit the basics on these couple of things because there are things that we're going to be talking more about over the next 13 days with this flock we're going to go ahead and try to follow them each day with a video take you clear to the end of production with them and uh, the topics in this video are things that we deal with all of production but we have a more front and center during this last two week period of production so going to take a look right at the birds and it's about 50 degrees fahrenheit outdoors might as well say the barn temperature is the same indoors as the outdoor temperature and that's why we put up the quantity of heat lamps that we do because we need to get it warm where the birds are living which for us in our building is down on the barn floor right so the two topics that we really want to just uh, catch the basics on in this video are managing the floor and observing characteristics in our birds that could indicate they're in heart failure, okay? So uh, like I said, if I've got my numbers right and if they're not exactly right, they're, they're super close, like within a day, but I'm pretty sure we're at 24 days on this flock and that would leave us 23 days from now they're going to the processor. So uh, I've been in here, what I've just now done is taken a pitchfork, which that's my pitchfork right there, and I've put the tines of the pitchfork, of course you hold the handle, and I've put the tines of the pitchfork under the bedding that's on the barn floor. I can show you, I can show you the barn floor without bedding. Just give me a second, okay? So the barn floor without bedding looks like that. It's not exactly gravelly and it's not just dirt. It's a stone product. We call it limestone screenings and it sets up really hard, makes a good foundation and uh, it'll still, you know, let water kind of go down through it. So uh, of course we don't want water coming in the barn, <laughs> but moisture won't just, you know, normal moisture won't just sit on top of it. Um, and like I said, with it setting up hard, we don't have a worry about it turning into mud under reasonable conditions and if we're taking good care of it. So I've just taken the tines of that pitchfork and it's, they love to climb on it. Anytime it's setting in here, there's always at least one bird climbing on it. But taking the tines of that pitchfork under this bedding material, which is just, I don't have a bag open within reach of fresh bedding, but it's, uh, it's packaged like these, okay? So inside there, it's just pine shavings. And when it's new, it looks a whole lot like that, actually. That's some that I've just turned over that is like new, okay? So we've explained that in a couple other videos. These birds, of course, spend all their time on this floor. And so they more or less compact this bedding constantly. And they'll actually compact it to the point that the top of it will 
absorb as much as it can, and then it'll like crust over. And I'm going to show you an example of that. And uh, particularly at the waters, it'll crust over uh, noticeably more than the rest of the pen, some at the feeders and some where they lay down and spend a lot of time resting. Oh, I've got to show you the further gymnastics. How about that? So uh, it'll, it'll crust over some in those spots, feeder and where the birds like to lay down. It'll compact a lot and could crust over, but it's going to crust over a lot at your waters. And I'm going to show you that here in just a second, what it looks like when it does that. Uh, because like when I put the pitchfork under this bedding and turn it over, when I turn it over, what's underneath looks, you know, almost like new bedding. It's loose and fluffy. You get around these waters and frequently the birds will come here and drink and they've, they've maybe been to eat first or they're going to go to eat next, but they'll manure while they're standing there. So, uh, and, and sometimes they'll, you know, drip water out of their beaks, but between them standing there and manuring there, and you can see even like beside this bird to the left, there's manure right there, a bird's been there manured. So they'll pack that manure down there and it crusts up right on top and you end up like with this instead of loose bedding. So that is this, this uh, bedding that where I've turned it here, I can turn it over and I get kind of loose, almost like new bedding. When I put the tines under it here around the waters and turn it over, I get some of this, okay? So we, we can take some of that out of the pen if we encounter that, but then in general, you know, we can just turn this bedding over and have fluffy, loose bedding for them to bed down into. And that's good for two reasons. First of all, when the bedding, whoops, gets like this, I stepped just on a water tray, no birds were, no birds were in the way, so nobody panic. But when it gets like this, the bedding will not absorb anymore. You're gonna have a mess, and you're gonna have manure from chickens, which in, in, uh, includes ammonia in the manure. You're gonna have that sitting on top of the surface. You're gonna have that burning your bird's feet and underbelly, possibly even where the chicken breast is. You don't want that. So uh, you want to, you know, turn the bedding occasionally, maybe every three, four days, or maybe as much as your pen requires. The more crowded the birds are, the faster they're gonna compact the bedding. The more space they have, the less they'll compact the bedding overall, but the high traffic areas, it's still gonna get compacted heavily. Around the waters, it's gonna get compacted heavily, okay? So these birds, uh, quick explanation on this, they have all this room, but they're laying here under these lights. So ambient temperature has got down to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. We know that our birds um, at this age, they want to be closer to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So they're going to go where the warmth is. And that is another advantage of managing your bedding and turning it over uh, occasionally to get as much absorption out of that bedding as you can. So first off, as I said, it's, you know, it keeps it able to absorb moisture from their manure and urine. It doesn't get to this point all over their pen where it can't absorb moisture. It stays loose and fluffy throughout the pen and can absorb moisture. So that's the first benefit of managing your bedding, tending to the bedding. The second benefit is that uh, it provides a little more warmth for your birds because if it's not absorbing moisture and a lot of that moisture is staying on top, that feels chilly to your birds if you know the ambient conditions around their building drop and they're impacted by that. But if we get it loose and fluffy again and they can sort of nestle down into it, you know, it's gonna have more warmth for them. So they're gonna appreciate that. So managing the bedding is a big deal throughout production, but managing the bedding becomes a bigger and bigger deal as we get close to the end of production. And I will interject here that one of the criticisms I have heard uh, people uh, contend about raising birds in confinement like this is that they get too dirty. They get so dirty. It's such a dirty way to raise them. It's not hygienic. Uh, I will counter that with telling you that we take our birds to a United States Department of Agriculture inspected processor. So that means the day that we take the birds to be processed, 
the uh, processor has contracted with an inspector who has certain um, you know, prerequisites and, and qualifications and credentials to be on site and to inspect the birds going through processing. So uh, when we take birds to the processor, we see other flocks <laughs> there at the same time that our birds are there. And I'm going to tell you, I'm countering that, that claim against raising birds indoors in a barn setting in confinement that, that claims the birds will be so dirty it's not hygienic. I'm countering that with, I've seen multiple flocks uh, at one time simultaneously when we go to processing. Our birds are generally always the cleanest birds that I see because of the floor management. So even though they are raised inside, even though they are raised in confinement, they're still gonna be clean birds because we place a high, high emphasis and prioritize keeping the floor cleaned up for them all of production, okay? So that becomes more and more important because as they're growing more and more, uh, what, gonna kind of walk this through the logic of it, what contributes to them growing more and more and more? Well, they have a, a uh, you know, predisposition for heavy appetite and heavier appetite the more they grow. So the more they're eating, the more they're gonna grow, but also the more they're eating, what's the natural consequence of that? They've gotta drink more water for their bodies to digest that food. If they're eating more and they're drinking more, what else are they gonna do more? They're gonna put out more waste, right? There's gonna be more manure, okay? So at, that's why I say, as we get closer and closer to finish, uh, managing the floor becomes a higher and higher priority. And uh, there'll be more details of that as we go on, but, but the floor also and the bedding also affects the ambient temperature the birds are feeling because it will put off heat from having absorbed that manure. So it'll put off heat from that. And that's part of the reason we turn it because after like three times turning it, we can kind of neutralize that. So, so the other thing Seb is gonna talk about when we start to see indicators in birds um, of like the heart failure, I'm going to try to hold the camera and unplug a heat lamp. I can't do it. So I won't be able to, well, I might be able to just move the lamp. Okay. The thing is you don't get, you're getting the red lighting when I've got that here, but I'm going to move the lamp. I want to show you the bird that's like crouched there. So we've just, uh, observed the, the first of these symptoms today, I'm saying that that bird is in heart failure. You see the fluffed up feathering, the strained look in the eye, the kind of rough look to the feathers, and definitely the excessive labor breathing. And it's not able to lay down uh, when it, so there's probably fluid building up in the body cavity. And when it lays down completely to try to relax, that buildup of fluid in the body cavity causes uh, respiratory distress, okay? So the buildup alone causes some respiratory distress. And then the more that bird would lay down um, and change that posture, it would increase that respiratory distress. So it's probably not gonna lay down. It's also to the point of distress that it's probably not concerned with going to food or going to water. Uh, at some point, this bird's heart is probably gonna give out on it. So um, I'm going to say, you know, within two or three days, we're probably going to see this bird pass away from heart failure. Uh, if you did not notice the symptoms ahead of time, it, it would be very easy to happen onto a dead bird one day in your flock and say, oh, sudden death syndrome, and it just died, and there was no indicator, and it looked normal the whole time. Well, it probably had some of these indicators ahead of time. And actually, as it gets closer to death, um, you, you can't really see it, especially with the red light on it. But at this point, actually the skin is getting that darkened look, um, you know, from the, well, I'm not gonna pull the feather back, but if we could see the skin, what ends up happening is, you know, from underneath the skin, uh, it, there's a, a change in the coloring that causes the skin to look uh, darker, maybe even kind of a bluish tint to a dark, dark red. Uh, not, not red like that, but 
kind of like a dark watermelon color almost it'll get a blue tint and not uh we don't have enough brightness for you to see like on that bird there's a there's a healthy pale pink tone to that skin it looks healthy and as these birds get further into these heart failure symptoms um, the the actual coloring of the skin tone takes on a different hue and that's that's always a giveaway too that we've got a bird that really uh, has has had heart distress set in um, I probably am going to move this bird over to the other side to the recovery pen but it's not going to help it at this point I don't think there's anything we can do to reverse that so so we're going to wrap this one up join us again and God bless y'all and we'll continue to take you through with this flock to finish